Heather, you want to get started then? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Well, how's it going? Good. Everybody good? My name's Art Munoz. I'm the Chief Investigator for the SPCA of Texas, and I've been here 16 years. And so everybody always asks me, well, how'd you get in this? And I was, well, went to college, played football, and when I realized I wasn't going to the NFL, I was like, well, <laughs> let me try the police academy, see where that takes me. So I went to police academy, and I started here when I was 21 years old. I've been doing it ever since. So. I'm going to go over a little bit of the laws, case reviews, uh, and some of the stuff we go through. So I really like throwing in case review because it shows kind of how it works, right? Instead of me just reading these boring laws to you. But I do want you to understand the laws because uh, sometimes the outside public doesn't really understand how it works from our standpoint. Um, people do have civil rights and we can't violate those even though we want to, <laughs> right? Uh, but there is ways around that that we can remove animals without having to go through some of the processes, but I can go through that. So, do we have any questions yet? Yeah. Yes, sir. Where is that from? Is this chapter 821 health and safety code from the Texas law? Order? Yeah, so that's going to be uh, under the health and safety code. And that's the code, and I'll go over this, but when I teach law enforcement all day, that's what I explain to them. I beat it to them all day. Okay, and I'll explain why here in a sec. Okay, so under the health and safety code, this is what we're gonna go by, okay? So, cruelly treated, and this is what we have to prove in court, all right? So, tortured, overworked, abandoned, deprived of necessary food, care, or shelter, which is a majority of the calls we get, cruelly confined, which is gonna be a lot of our hoarding cases, right? And then cause to fight with another animal. That's gonna be our dog fighting, cock fighting. Uh, and those are gonna be separate codes. So, what do we do, right? Health and safety code, so anytime we come across, across a case and we need to seize them, this is what we're gonna work under, all right? And it kind of goes of seizure of animal, how it works. Um, so, if we have probable cause that we need to remove those animals or animal, what we're gonna do is apply for a seizure warrant with a JP or municipal judge. Okay, now remember, this is still civil. This has nothing to do criminally yet, all right? So if we believe that animals cruelly treated, we may apply for that warrant, okay? So this is just saying that we can basically go take your stuff, right? So here in Texas, animals are considered property, all right? It's not an animal, it's considered property. So it's like me going in your house and taking your couch. It's the same thing, and that's the way the law reads. So, once we take it to the judge, and this is why we work under this code here, is because we're gonna have a hearing within 10 days, 10 calendar days, and that's important. Now, you can seize animals under the criminal code of procedure, but guess what? We have to hold those animals all the way up until the trial, criminal trial. And that's just not reasonable for any shelter, municipal shelter, or nonprofit organization because sometimes it could be a year or two years before we're even in those trials. So this is why it's so important we use this code when seizing animals. Is that why you all hesitate so often, or why officers hesitate so often to do anything because just having to hold the animals? I think depending on what area you're in, probably. Uh, for us, I mean, we know we're going to work this code, so we're kind of trained and we're kind of experts on using this code here. Uh, smaller agencies that might not have the resources might not know what warrant to get because they call me every day. Or just like BPD, they hesitate as opposed to, you know, other than your group of officers mm -hmm. here, but like BPD, they'll hesitate. Um, and is that part of the reason? No, I think, you know, and, and I'll get into beyond a reasonable doubt and being able to prove that they are cruelly treated, ownership, there's a lot of things that go into it that maybe DPD is not trained yet because uh, they just started their unit and we'll go over that. And I can't read this here. Okay, so we're still in the safe code. So what do we do? Once we go to court, the judge can do several things. So we're gonna put on our evidence 
And if the animal owner does show up, they can put on their evidence, okay? Uh, and they can hire an attorney. Uh, they don't have to, but they can. Uh, and once we put on all our evidence and the judge really makes that decision if those animals were cruelly treated, then she has the option of, or he has the option of this right here. So order a public sale of the animals by auction. That's typically gonna be our livestock animals, okay? Order the animal given to municipal or county animal shelter or nonprofit. This is what we're wanting, and that's what we ask for. Order the animal humanly destroyed. Uh, if the court decides that's the best interest of the animal or public health, uh, and they'll order that that way. Now, also, we're going to ask for restitution, not because we want to, but because we have to, because that's what the law. Okay, so the judge shall order restitution in these cases. So the judge can't say, no, I can't do it, they have to. All right, now, whether that's $10,000 or $5, the judge can do that too. But we gotta come up with costs of what it took for our investigations, witnesses, housing, caring of the animals. Yeah, so we're getting, we're getting better. But typically, we don't see that because this is just a civil order. So there's really no repercussion if they don't pay. Uh, what is it? Just for a threat. Yeah. I, I mean, and there's what we'll send it to our attorneys, and there's ways that we can, if they got collateral on things, there's ways. But for the most part, a lot of these people that we're seizing animals from typically don't have million dollar properties and homes and stuff. So. And that's kind of the same thing. So if the judge finds that, you know, we couldn't prove that it was cruelly treated, then they give the animal back. And so sometimes that happens with hoarding cases. Uh, it just depends on what courtroom you're in. Um, you know, there might be one dog that was in good shape and depending on the situation, the judge might order us 50 dogs and give them one back, you know, under circumstances. So. If they do that, we typically ask that the animals spayed, neutered, and go from there. Um, just real quick. So, um, are, is there any sort of arrangement made where if the owner is given the license to your animal, that there is a time where you're able to lease that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, good question. So, the judge can put that in the order, uh, and we try our best to, to do those rechecks. Typically what, do what? Unannounced. Yeah, and we do that, and that's typically what it is, is we can show up at any time. Uh, and we'll go into the criminal side here in a sec, but that's why I recommend we do file these cases criminally, because we can put that as part of their probation or bond, and they have to abide by that. If they don't, then they go to jail. So on the civil side, they don't have to let us in, or they can refuse us access to the property, and nothing happens. Criminally, you have to. Okay. Uh, you just crossed the bound there when you were talking previously about the, uh, keeping the animal under the civil proceedings. Mm -hmm. Now you're talking about criminal court cases. Uh, yeah, so, so. Can you kind of explain about the procedure that follows that? Right. Okay. So once we go to the civil side, and I'm about to get into that now, is what do we do now? So we look at our cases and we work with the DA's office, and after we go to the civil uh, hearings, and we win and the judge, you know, determined that they were cruelly treated. Now what do we do on a criminal side? So we look at it and look and see, does it fit that criteria of one? Whenever we're embedded here in Dallas County, um, we'd actually have to type up the arrest warrant and then get them arrested before we could file a case because Dallas County does not accept at-large cases. Other counties, we could put it together and file it with the DA's office uh, and then they'll accept the case. So it's kind of different, but we look at it to see does it fit that criteria and it's something that can we prove beyond a reasonable doubt that's the big issue there right and so that's what the da's offices are looking at and we'll go into so now we're going to be looking under the penal code so here in texas we got two different types non-livestock animals and livestock animals
So it just depends what county you're in. So like if you, DPD, they would file those cases. Okay. Yeah. And so we have MOUs in other counties where our commission is held, or police officers, and so we actually file those cases directly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, no, they're still going to file a case on that, but that case was a little bit more complex. So the girl that put the dog in the jar didn't own the dog. So it was somebody else who wasn't home, didn't know that was going on. And that, that's why I was returned to that owner, and then she had to provide the vet care. And so there were some issues going on there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Probably, yes. I'm not too sure outside of Texas, uh, but here, yeah, they're considered property. Yeah, juveniles. Okay. Yeah, so juveniles, it's good and bad. Uh, the good thing is we don't have to type up an arrest warrant. We just take them to jail, take them over to Henry Wade, file the case and we'll let the juvenile courts handle it. Uh, but because they're juvenile, there's certain things you got to go by uh, and really get in touch with the parents and go through all that process. So it's a little different. But we do get a lot of juvenile cases. And so when I teach this to law enforcement, I recommend filing those cases, especially with juveniles that are, you know, torture cases or because what happens? Later on, yeah. Yeah. yeah so. Yeah, so that's why we file those cases. We take those seriously so they can get the help now instead of 10 years from now. It's something bigger. Yep, oh, let me go back. So one thing I'll point out with livestock and non-livestock is a person commits an offense if he knowingly or intentionally. And we'll go to non-livestock, which we'll have recklessly. Um, and livestock here, the, the population community with livestock is really big here and it has a big influence on our legislative so if you see anything in red that's gonna be a felony everything else is a class A misdemeanor but typically what we see with livestock animals is not providing necessary food water care in a person's custody now one thing we gotta say here is shelter is not required for a livestock animal Abandoned an animal, we get those a lot here in Texas. Uh, transport or confines a livestock animal in a cruel and unusual manner. Typically, it's gonna be horses uh, within stalls that are never let out, things of that nature. It's typically what we're gonna see on a full confinement. And then here's a felony one, admitted poison. Uh, it's a livestock animal. What else do you than? do? What? Other than? Cattle? Yeah, just cattle, horses, sheep. No, it just, I think it's for veterinary type purposes, so. And we don't see that very often. But. And the way it reads, it sounds like. That you can poison, poison other than, than, yeah. Other yeah. Animals, it's bad, but cattle, horses, sheep, swine. No, okay. Okay. no. The legislature. Yeah, they, they word it a little weird. <laughs> And then causes one livestock animal to fight with another. Now this has nothing to do with dog fighting or cock fighting. It actually down south is kind of big. I think it's fading away, but they would fight horses. And you're like, what? So what they would do is put two studs in a mare and actually watch them fight to the death. So that's why that's in there. We typically don't see that here, but it is known down south. So. And then here's what we see. So horse tripping. I don't know if y'all heard of that at the rodeos, uh, unsanctioned rodeos. They have a lot of this here, which is a felony. Mm -hmm. So it's part of rodeoing. Oh, I've never seen that. Yeah. So um, bad deal. It really causes broken legs, things of that nature. So. Like the ring, they took them off rodeo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just like calf roping, but with horses. Yeah. 
and in here abandoned. So we get these a lot. And then of course here, custody. And let me kind of read this so we understand. So includes responsibility for the health, safety, and welfare of a livestock animal subject to the person's care and control, regardless of ownership. And the reason why that's in there is whenever we work a lot of these cases, oh, that animal didn't belong to me. It was my friend who left it here. No. Nope. So if you're in care, custody, control of an animal, you get charged for it, not your friend. So if I come. You're able to charge the girl and put the dog correct. in the dryer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if I come to your house, and I say, hey, can you take care of my horse? Yeah. And I leave and never come back. And you're like, well, I'm not going to feed it. Who goes to jail? Right. Yeah. So that's why that's in there. And so that's a good law to have because that happens a lot. A lot of the cases we filed here in Dallas, outside of Dallas County and the other counties we work. All day long. I all, my dog. Yeah. All day. Well, that was my friend's dog. He put it back there. And, So that too, but see, that's kind of a thin line because you get into more civil than criminal because I'm paying for a service. And so, you know. Kind of like weed and castaway. Yeah, you know, one of those things, so. <coughs> and it just kind of has, you know, here includes food, what necessary food is, extent required, maintain the livestock animal, state of good health. So one thing we got to point out to none of this says we have to provide vet care. It just says care enough to sustain that animal in good health. So that's one thing we got to work by too. So, and in torture, so on the livestock side, even if we prove a torture case, it's still just a state jail felony. On the non-livestock side, it's a third degree felony. And here's just some of the defense prosecutions, which we'll go back there. So livestock, here's some of our cruelty cases that we've worked. Uh, and this is a cattle case we worked out in Grayson County, but we seized right around 75 head of cattle. So in this case, we actually filed the DA's office and he was prosecuted for this, which is great here in Texas. Filing, you know, cattle cases in Texas and actually getting a prosecution is almost non-existent. Okay. Yeah, uh, so, so fun. yeah, <laughs> and here you can see uh, failure to provide, right, and they fail to provide necessary care. So what happens here is a horse, donkey, they get foundered, and so that is pain. Anybody ever stub their toe? Yeah, that's what that feels like walking on that all day. And so those are cases we really go after and prosecute because that we can prove is pain. Some are, some are not. A lot of times that rotates or those coffin bones break. And at that point, the quality of life. Horse case, uh, out in the pasture no food no water uh, you know texas we have thousands of people moving here every month and so when you move to texas what do we do oh i'm gonna get me a horse i'm gonna buy me some land and this is typically what happens because they put it out there and think yep yeah, he was living in there so <laughs> that was george that was george back there uh but <laughs> Yeah, so uneducated, and a lot of what we do is actually education. You'd be surprised the people we deal with don't know they have to feed their animals every day. Some of the culture, how they grew up. Um, and so what we do, a lot of what we do is education. Educate them and then return it back? Or? Typically, no. Uh, if we end up seizing or they surrender that animal, we're not going to give it back because there was a reason why we did that. Uh, if we end up seizing or taking animals from somebody, it's usually our last resort. We always try to work with them, uh, especially if it's education and they want animals and they want to provide that care. How can we help them do that, right? So is there any, like, from here forward, are they, like, not allowed to adopt any animals? Or yeah, it just depends. Yeah. 
if we serve a warrant, then yeah, we're, we put them on our no adopt list. Uh, even if we surrender animals and it's a potential criminal case moving forward, then yeah, we don't do that. But there's no official do not adopt issue. Not that I know of, but from our organization, there is. Yeah, so. Okay, so now we're looking at cruelty to non-livestock animals. And it's just same, similar definitions. Uh, a ban includes banning the animal a person's custody without making any reasonable arrangements or assumptions of custody. We work these cases every week. You'd be surprised how many abandoned animals are here in Texas. And in cruel manner, uh, you know, that's going to be our hoarding cases. And in custody is the similar thing, uh, regardless of ownership. If you're in care custody control of that animal, you're responsible for it. Yeah, and I'll go over the, okay. and here, same thing, necessary food, water, shelter includes the extent required to maintain that animal in good health. So, you know, one thing I like to reiterate, it doesn't have, don't have to take your dog to a vet, unfortunately, but as long as he's in good shape, it doesn't matter what kind of care you provide for him, okay? And that's something the DA's offices look at when prosecuting these cases. Okay, so. Several years ago, legislative said, you know what? If we're able to prove torture, it's gonna be a third degree felony. And that was great, because when that happened, we were passing out third degree felonies like Oprah. You like Oprah, right? Yeah. So, torture is an animal and cruel manner kills causing serious bodily injury without the owner's effect consent kills, administers poison to or causes serious bodily injury. So anything that we can prove cause serious bodily injury we're handing them out. Let's get them arrested, charged. Third degree felony also ups their bonds. So I think here in Dallas County, depending on their criminal history, a bond is set anywhere between 500 and 1500. Third degree felonies, we're jacking it up to 20. Um, they would set them at 25,000. I try to go to her all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm judge, you gonna believe this. Look at this. <gasps> oh my God. So, well, this is part of the, just getting them, arrest, getting them arrested, filing the case, and then the DA's office, they determine how that works. Oh, so the 25,000 be a bond? Just a bond, oh, so, okay. yeah. So once we get them arrested, yeah. Once they're arrested, there's a bond for them to get out of jail. Right, it's or just, yeah, so that's going to be under the health and safety code. Okay. Yeah, so criminally, I can't charge anybody because they didn't vaccine or have their dogs vaccinated. That's going to be, well, I think it's good now because that's under a lot of the uh, municipalities and their um, ordinances. And so they, I know they write citations for that all day. Spay and neuter, if your dog's not spayed or neuter, they write them citations. Uh, so that works good on that part. You just can't put anybody in jail for it. <laughs> One more question. How do y'all become aware of most of these cases? Of and torture and everything? Is it phone calls? Yeah, so we receive these, uh, these calls three different ways. They go online and file a complaint, or they can call us directly, or law enforcement will call us directly. Yeah. And I'll talk about, we'll go over a case review, a case that happened in Dallas. Um, kind of worked out great, but it could have been bad. And typically, this is what we're going to see. Majority of our cases is what we get right here. Fails to provide the necessary food, water, and care, or shelter in a person's custody. That's majority of our cases. And so then the shelter is defined by the municipality? Yeah, so that's what we're trying to do this last legislative session is uh, try to define what shelter is because the shelter is defined differently. So I might think shelter is having an igloo with hay in it and somebody else might say, well, I just put some plywood up and it's good to go, you know, so yeah. <laughs> and so you got to look at it too. One thing that I've learned 
uh, is every DA's office interprets the law differently. So what we might prosecute here in Dallas, they might prosecute some differently in Kaufman County. And up, let's see. And these are just kind of defense prosecutions. So, uh, you know, causing serious bodily injury. If this is typically out in the counties, you don't see this very much here in Dallas. Um, but if your animal comes onto my property and it's destroying my property or my livestock, um, I can use deadly force. So, so that's in there. Yeah. They can. They can. Yeah. So, yep. Yeah. So you can. It's in there. And also, it has a public servant. So, law enforcement as well. Um, lawfully, if an animal's trying to attack them, they can use deadly force as well. So. And that's just kind of licensing for fishing and stuff like that. So how does it work? So I like showing this case because it's a really good case review. And some of this is kind of graphic, so is everybody okay? Yeah, she's not paying attention. <laughs> um, so this call here we got was a pit bull tied up uh, on a front porch of a trailer home. And when we actually went out there, this is what I saw. Um, and I thought, well, I thought the dog was gone. I didn't hear anything. There's no yard. Uh, and so I was banging on the door trying to make contact with somebody. And I was actually going to clear my call. Uh, but I heard what sounded like a fate, sounded like a chain. And I was like, what is that? Oh. And I lifted up the plywood, and this is what we found. Now, we do have exigent type circumstances in Texas. So you can remove animals under exigent circumstances, but you gotta be able to prove that. So I could actually have taken this dog without a warrant and then go back and serve the warrant. But you gotta be able to articulate that in court because you are taking somebody's property. Is that what you did? So with this dog here, he was very friendly. He jumped up. So he was active, so I had time to go get my warrant. Uh, and what we did is I called uh, constable's office to sit on the property, make sure nobody came and mess with my evidence. So let me go back. Uh. So with this case here, and I don't have the rest up there, but uh, when it got the warrant, seized the animal. And you can see there's, you know, burn marks down his back. And actually when I thought of that, I thought, battery acid or something had burned that dog down there um, in this case kind of took a while to prove ownership so uh, they lived in a trailer home and when we finally made contact with the owner we interviewed her and asked her you know hey tell me about your dog you know she said well it belonged to my husband and there we go with care custody control right i said okay she said well he was deported back to mexico and i didn't know what to do with the dog i said well why'd you keep under there well, we, we weren't allowed to have pit bulls in the trailer home, so I thought I could just hide them under there. I said, okay. Um, so we interviewed her and asked her about the burns on the back. In this case here, we filed a class A misdemeanor, uh, and, I, and I'll explain why we couldn't do the third degree felony. So uh, she stated that her and her husband went out of town, and when they got back, some kids poured battery acid on the dog's back. So, uh, and she did provide the vet care. She did take it to the vet. I actually got all the vet records, photographs, and, but, so we weren't able to prove that. I couldn't prove that she did it, beyond a reasonable doubt. She had the vet care. She had the vet care for it. Shocking that she was still interested in Right, so we still charged her. Uh, and she got, she had no criminal history. And so I know the DA's office take that into consideration on how they're going to work jail time and that. So I think she got two years probation and had to pay restitution. And here's the key on these cases is she's not allowed to be around animals. So. I have a question. If a vet sees a dog in that condition that's obviously starving, why don't 
So some do, some don't. So that confidentiality, confidentiality between uh, owner and the vet, there's not any more. So they can report that. And by law, they have to. So uh, with the vet there, I mean, uh, they must have believed, you know, hey, accident happened, kids did something, they're providing the care. Uh, but they worked with me when I contacted them. So. No, this is not her. <laughs> but I'll tell you about this sweet lady right here. So, <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, sweet as pie right here. Uh, one thing that we also teach too is the link between human violence and animal cruelty. Uh, and I'm here to tell you that it is real. So we deal with that on a daily basis from elderly abuse, domestic violence, um, and child abuse. That's one thing that we see and we have to be trained on what we're looking at. Uh, and so even though our job is very narrow in what we do, we still have to stay trained in other crimes as well because animal cruelty is just the hub of criminal activity. So there's so many things that goes on. So this case was a family violence case. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we have that MOU with DPD and working with them. Um, and this is not to bash DPD in any way, but this happened in 2016, uh, New Year's Eve night. DPD gets dispatched to a family violence call. So it's her and her husband who lives with another uh, couple, wife and husband. They go out drinking, they get into an altercation at their, they lived over in the projects over in South Dallas. Uh, and if you, if I can explain the house, so you walk in, it's a two-story apartment, uh, kitchen, and then you go upstairs and it's like a Jack and Jill bedroom. So one couple's living in one bedroom, the other couple's living in the other bedroom. So they get in a fight over discrepancy over money. Uh, so she gets a baseball bat and starts to try to hit the other lady that's living there with her roommate. Well, when the lady is trying to back away from her, she opens her bedroom door, her dogs come out. She didn't know it, so when she gets back in the room, she slams the door, hears something, her dog crying, comes out, dogs laying there, blood splatter on the floor. She calls 911. No, the other lady, okay. the owner of the dogs. Calls 911, says, hey, this lady just beat my dog, baseball bat, and she was trying to hit me with it, so DPD gets the call as a family violence. They get there, and all they're worried about is family violence. Time. They're not worried about the animal cruelty. Um, one, they, they're not really trained on how that works. So officers really didn't do a report on animal cruelty, but the ladies, the owner, she actually called us that very next day, thank God, and told me what happened. And so we start the case and uh, let's see here. So here's kind of the upstairs where it happened. And then so how this worked out is I actually interviewed her. <laughs> uh, when I spoke with, I'm gonna use her as witness. So the witness called me and I'm thinking that this, they don't even live there no more, that this all happened, they're all out. She said, you can come to my house, she's not there no more. I wanna show you the blood splatter still there. I said, cool, let's go, perfect. She has access to that house, so I didn't need a warrant at the time. I could follow her in. <laughs> and then we go back, oops, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so, Sweetest pie sitting in the living room. <laughs> I didn't know this. And she didn't tell me anything. So she, we just walked by here and I'm just thinking maybe that's her friend. And so we go upstairs and I'm kind of like, okay, kind of walk me through what happened. And then next thing I know, there's a full blown disturbance going on. And so having to calm down that scene was a little crazy, but so now, you're in the family violence. now I'm in the family violence deal. So. <laughs> So, but it was good because I had a chance to actually interview her. So, uh, and she said some good things and she admitted to having a baseball bat but denied hitting the dog 
with the baseball bat. She said that, you know, she believed it, or she said that she accidentally slammed the dog's head between the wall and the door. And the, and the stairwell. Yeah. Uh, and so at this time, the owner actually took it to an emergency vet, and so I had all those records of blunt force trauma to the head and to the ribs. Uh, so I already had a good case, right? It was just interviewing her and kind of beyond that reasonable doubt filing this case, make sure we're good to go. So uh, she wouldn't show me where the baseball was at, baseball bat was at. She said it was in her trunk of her car. And then she started getting a little wild with me. So uh, I actually went and got search warrants for the car and the inside of her residence. Well, by the time I got back, the car was gone. Um, but she tried to hide the baseball bat in the closet. So the cool thing is we uh, actually found blood on the baseball bat. So it really corroborated everything we had. Uh, and we actually did the third degree felony. Uh, and we tried to arrest her, I don't know how many times. Uh, we just couldn't find her. And so, and this is karma. <laughs> She's getting in a fight with her husband several months down the road and calls 911, says, my husband's blah, blah, blah. Well, law enforcement shows up and we need to get him identified and she has that third degree felony rest warrant for her, so uh, yeah so so we're gonna go into a little bit of dog fighting it is some of the pictures are a little graphic are you guys okay with that yeah. I mean, we kind of skip through it yeah so this case I'm not sure if they've disposed of it yet but I think they're still trying to figure out what her jail time is gonna be because she did have a criminal history. So, uh, but that's up to the district attorney's office on how that works. But you don't, if you're getting, for animal cruelty, you don't just get sent to jail for that particular charge, or you do? You can, mm -hmm. yeah. So, class A misdemeanor, you can go to jail for one year in prison, class A. State so jail, correct, correct, jail. correct. So, state jail felony is up to two years. Okay, now we're doing a third degree can be two to 10 years, right? So they're trying to figure out how they want to do the sentencing and working with her attorneys. And uh, so one or two things. Yeah, you know, every, you know, maybe if I follow this case in Kaufman County, she gets three years. I follow here in Dallas and she gets 60 days in jail. You know, there's just so many cases coming around, uh, coming through you know just hard to say and so what we try to do is kind of educate our prosecutors our judges and let them know hey these are serious type crimes uh, and 75 to 80 percent of the people we're following cases on have other violent crimes and so we need to start getting those put in jail follow these cases put that on the books so and it's just the reality of it Right? I mean, I hate to show this, but this is the reality of it. This is what we're dealing with, right? And so these are the aftermath of these cases. And dog fighting in Texas is huge. Dog fighting in the southern region is huge. It's a big profit here. And these cases are hard to prosecute at times. So uh, some of the physical indicators, uh, ear cropping, uh, wounds, abscesses, bite marks, scars on the head, throat, legs, and ears, um, wide leather collars, they're chained up on heavy chains, multiple dogs, puncture wounds, bleeding, uh, and then we'll go into the paraphernalia, but these are some of the indicators we're looking at. Uh, Why is it so hard to stop? So, Proving, it just depends, you know, if we catch a dog fight in progress, that's obviously easy, right? Uh, but if I have 30 dogs on my property uh, and they meet some of these indicators but we don't find any paraphernalia, uh, how can we still prove this case? And some of the defenses is, well, my dog got off the chain and it got to fight with another dog. And so those are some of the things we got to deal with. Yeah, and, and you know, unfortunately, I mean, if they want to crop their ears, there's nothing illegal about it. What is the current handling uh, 
Yeah, so tethering just depends. Uh, tethering is, here in Dallas, is against the ordinance. So you can't have any animals tethered. So it's municipality. Municipality. Uh, and so by, under the health and safety code, you can't have your animal tethered from 10P to 6A, but how do you enforce that, right? So can't. you can't, but any time between then you can't. So you can't tether it at noon? From noon all the way up to 10 p.m. <laughs> and so that's why we've been trying to work with, yeah, that, right. That's why we've been trying to work with the legislators is how do we get this changed? Because it's unenforceable, we can't enforce it. Okay, so paraphernalia, spring pole, and actually this is more of elements towards that crime. Under the law, that's not illegal to have. So you can have a spring pole. What else could that be used for that makes it okay? Well, no, that's what it's for. It, well, so it's really to strengthen their jaw muscles, back muscles, and things like that. But other people that have dogs actually use it just as playtime and okay. stuff like that. So, oh, okay. yeah. Okay. And so that's kind of what this is here. Okay. But this is a dog fighting case we did. And you see he had the spring pole there and they would latch onto that. And, and so the reason why we photographed that and we testified to that is this is consistent with dog fighting paraphernalia, is having that elements that goes with those indicators. Just yeah, just to put in there. And our flirt pole, and that's not illegal to have there, but they'll tie a hide or a rag at the very end of this, and it just creates agility, really enhances their agility. So. Treadmill is illegal. You can't have it. It's a class A misdemeanor. So that's one thing we look at when working these cases. Because now we have paraphernalia. And we could actually charge them with Isn't this. Yeah. I mean they they have them. I mean they're not out in the open, but uh, a lot of times we work closely with narcotics here in Dallas and other counties, and so when they run raids, they'll call us, say, hey, we found this, and so that's. When you're uh, getting your warrant to like, seize an animal, is it mostly based on like photos that you take, or is it a lot of like, verbal description of what you're seeing? You have to have like, photos? Yeah, so basically it's what I saw, my report. Uh, typically, I don't even bring photos. Okay. So uh, just my based off my report, my findings, the judge reads it and is like, okay, it's either yes or no. They take a word of a peace officer, but yeah. they can't just take the public's word. Yeah, so word of we're kind of swearing to that warrant that that dog is malnourished, and we're not. I don't need photos because I'm going to see all that whenever the hearing is. But class A misdemeanor paraphernalia. That's what we're looking for when we want to prosecute these cases, and also helps us when we're trying to get those warrants. Right? Break sticks. And this is to pry the dogs from each other when fighting. You can have them, it's not illegal. But it's still part of that element, right? And so we're gonna testify that, we're gonna put that in our report of what we believe was happening. Like this here has bite marks. And that was a dog fighting case we worked in Terrell five years ago. So the laws, in red, state jail felony, causes a dog to fight with another dog, participates in the earnings, uses or permits another to use any real estate, building, room, tent, arena, property for fighting. So these are our three <clears throat> That's pretty good, and we get a lot of these, so we can work those. Here is gonna be our class A, which we still file these. So if we can't prove these, we can still prove these. And it's good, because if we can file these cases, even though they're class A, they're still on the books, right? So they're gonna be known as a dogfighter in their criminal history. So owning and possessing dogfighting equipment was a treadmill. Owns or trains a dog with the intent that the dog be used in exhibition of dogfighting. 
So if we have the treadmill, we have the other elements, even though we didn't catch them in the act of dogfighting, we can still file this here. You can have the other elements, okay, but the treadmill, no. Yes. Yes. But we're still going to put that in there in our reports is, I, I, I label it as dogfighting paraphernalia. So. Ah, oh, so good question. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, you have three types of dogfighting, right? You have your hobbyist, your street level, uh, and your professionals. And so just from all walks of life, I mean, I've seen teachers, police officers, uh, athletes, football, a lot of football players. Uh, before Mike Vick was busted, I knew about Mike Vick here in Texas, so uh, it's well known. So that happens all over social media, right? And so it's just kind of knowing where that's at. Um, two, I think when the DA's office looks at these cases, you got to have the elements to go with it. So if you're wanting to file a class A misdemeanor with somebody owning treadmills, the pit bulls on the property with scarring, cropped ears, uh, maybe the, the spring poles and things of that nature, you want to have those elements behind it because there are people that own dogs who have treadmills, but they're not using them for the purpose of dog fighting. And so when you go back here in furtherance of dog fighting, so that's what you have to prove is that they're using that for the purpose of dog fighting. So that's why those cases there when they're selling treadmills and stuff on social media, yeah, we know what we're doing, but how do we prove that, right? It's tough, it can be tough. It's like a red flag. It, it is, yeah. And so, uh, yeah. And if you had enough officers, you can, yeah, I mean, if we had so many officers, I could actually have one that just did social media, you know, but we're, we're spread thin. And I think that's law enforcement statewide, so. And then cockfighting, which is huge here in Texas. And it's been in families and generations and cultures and religions for years, years. And so these are tough to work because, you know, a lot of people we deal with believe this is their right to fight roosters. I dealt with a guy a couple weeks ago. And this is a case we worked in. And this is a funny case, actually. So, uh, Lady calls and said, I'm tired of these guys urinating on the side of my house when they're fighting roosters. Can y'all do something about it? <laughs> I said, yeah, what's been going on? Well, I didn't want to report it, but it's been going on for years, but I'm tired of them urinating on the side of my house. Can y'all do something about the rooster fighting? I said, sure. And so this is in a residential neighborhood in Pleasant Grove. Uh, and so what we decided to do was a plain clothes walk up, knock and talk. Uh, so I actually walked up in plain clothes to see if we can get probable cause and then move in. Now with your dog fight and cock fighting, if we witness this, it's exigent, I don't have to go get a search warrant. Let's go ahead and get it stopped, get it, you know, stop the cruelty, and then we can go back and get our search warrants. Uh, and so there was like metal sheet fencing. <laughs> And so when I look over, there's about 50 to 60 people and they see me and they're trying to invite me. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, one second. <laughs> Let me go get my friend. Yeah, so I said, pasale, pasale, I'll be there, hold on. Uh, so then we uh, called DPD, which I already had them staged. Um, and once we actually went in, I've never seen so many people that could jump a 15-foot fence, but they did. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, we're able to uh, apprehend, I think, 20 individuals. Uh, and this was a good case. So uh, not only did we charge the homeowner, uh, we had three or four other cases we charged with the evidence we found on scene. Uh, 
And so we did multiple arrest warrants after this. This was a long investigation. So whenever we raid these properties, I mean, it's a lot of work that's entailed going through the vehicles. I try to get these people identified who they are, what charges can we prove. Um, and so this was a good deal. Uh, and this was the ring that had set up. And there's all the birds. So we're able to remove, I think, 120 birds that day. Rarely. It's a different culture. Uh, they know about it, and they know people that do it, but when I speak with each, they're like, oh, no, I don't mess with that. You know, or when I, because I deal with a lot of the guys who fight roosters here, and say, I know them, and when I speak with them, you know, they're like, no, no, no that's, that's animal cruelty. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what they believe. And in dealing with dog fighters, you know, they're like, oh, no, man, them chickens. It's just chickens. So most of the roosters, if we can't find, uh, there are some facilities that will take them in uh, and let them kind of live out their life. But you know they can only take a few at a time. Uh, and, and unfortunately, we when we do these raids, we have hundreds of birds that come in. Uh, and so if they can take five or six or whatever, we try to get them out the best we can. But typically, these birds are dangerous. Yeah. They're extremely dangerous, and they will hurt a small child. They will hurt. I mean. They are dangerous. So uh, most of the roosters, we typically have to euthanize them. Uh, the hens, though, we get them adopted out. So, And here's some of the paraphernalia. So these are a little bit more easier to prosecute because that is what it is, right? What are you going to do that? Right. That is what it is. So it's class A misdemeanor. Um, and these are our gavs, and these are considered short knives. We follow these all day. We get these a lot. Uh, we just did a case in Bulk Springs where they just had this laying around in their front yard. I was like, oh, perfect. <laughs> so, but you can see, and it causes serious bodily injury. It's really bad. So, and this kind of goes to indicators, but typically, you know, if you're raising hundreds of Gamecocks, typically that's what you're using them for. Um, anytime they remove their comb and waddle, that's considered dubbed. And so that's in preparation for fighting. A lot of them will tell you it's for shows. They do have rooster shows, chicken shows. Well, they actually do do that, but uh, typically that's probably what they're using them for. Have mm -hmm. Yeah. So what are the laws? We only have two felonies, right? Causing one to fight with another and then participates in the earnings. That's our two felonies right there. <clears throat> if we use this permits another, like the other guy who was using this property, that's a class A. And then owning, possessing, manufacturing, the gabs, knives um, is a class A. And attends as a spectator is a class C citation. And so whenever, and these cases can be difficult at times because when we raid these cases, typically what do people do? They run. And so it's like, how do you prove they were fighting roosters or were they just there watching? Because when you catch them, what do they say? Yeah. I was just watching. I was here for the beer. So... But that's where a lot of our work comes in, right? Interviewing everybody there, um, vehicles, what was left on scene, because um, they have index cards. Uh, anytime you enter in, most here in Texas are called derbies, so you'll fight four or five birds, uh, and they gotta come in at a certain weight. And some people put their name actually on the index cards. And so, or some people put their kennel name, uh, and so able to do that, you can probably prove some of these cases, in which we have. So so. That's right. We don't catch the smart ones. So. Yeah, so like Black Mamba. Yeah, like Black Mamba had five roosters. And the same thing with like dog fighting kennels, you know. 
rolling thunder. If we can prove, yeah. So, yeah. And so we keep a, a database of that because we'll talk with them and these guys are proud. Oh, what's the name of your, your, your kennel? Black Mamba. <laughs> <laughs> and so we just keep that in our database. And so whenever we do end up rating something and we see that, we can go back. So, so I, I guess they only write that down because they think they're not very likely to be caught. Right, true. yeah. I mean, they just don't know. And these guys are so proud. And so when we interview them, we kind of use like a relaxed interview as if I'm just talking with you and we're just kind of talking and we just get to talking. I might talk about something totally different and then I'll ask them something about cockfighting. And then I'll go back to something different and then I'll ask them something about cockfighting and they'll just, they'll talk. Some. Some. But, but is, is it the case that the majority of people who do it would be unlikely to be caught during their entire cockfighting career? Or is it likely that you'll catch them? Eventually, they'll be caught. Okay. I mean, they're doing it every weekend eventually it'll happen so and the guys know it i mean I, I speak with them even when we arrest them you know they're like oh y'all finally got me you know so and some of them they're just tired of running I'm, i know several of them that we've, i've seen it a lot of them you know we write them citations for spectating one guy we did uh, a month ago he said i was just tired of running that's why i stood here and waited for you Wow, perfect. <laughs> so, domestic violence. This was another case, uh, and we're able to, and this is a great case to talk about because this guy actually got four years in prison, which is really good. Um, so, this was another domestic violence type of case that happened at Farmers Branch, Texas. Young kid sad he's 21 years old his girlfriend was 19 they get in a fight um, he ended up taking her dog in the backyard and beat this dog with his hands bad she didn't know it what happened at the time so he comes back in the house and he's acting different she's like what happened he's like, i don't know she's like where's my dog his name was Roberto, and uh, I don't know. So she goes in the backyard and finds him there, laying there, hardly breathing. He's actually, you can't tell there, but his eyes were actually out of his socket. Uh, so she takes to an emergency vet right away. And this happened at 2, 3 in the morning. Um, and so getting the call from the vet's office, because she actually made a statement and said, I think my boyfriend beat my dog. And so right there, it triggered the vet to call. And so we started the case. Um, I interviewed her, which was difficult because she didn't want to say much, her boyfriend, uh, but she did, if that makes sense. It's kind of like, well, I'll give you this, but you're going to have to figure out the rest. And so she did good because she actually took pictures of his hands. Uh, because he said that, well, your dog was trying to bite me. And she's like, well, I want to see. Yeah, and this is a Yorkshire mix that was 12 pounds. So uh, I can never find the guy. I try to find him to talk with him, interview him, kind of get his side of the story. I never could. But based off the findings of what she gave me in her statement, the photos of his hands, I actually did the arrest warrant and said, Let's get him in jail and go from there. Um, and we got him arrested. Uh, he didn't want to take it to trial. And so he agreed to serve four years in prison instead of maybe getting the 10. So when, so right? Question, I know another example of a guy videotaped beating his large dog in the backseat of his vehicle. Um, Yeah, and so that's what we do, or we'd work the case, but we'd also bring PD as well and say, hey, we can work the angle for animal cruelty. Can you work this as a domestic violence type of deal, right? And those are hard. Those social media cases are hard. 
um, because we might not have that vet examination behind it. So we don't know if he did cause serious bodily injury or was he just, you know, it looks bad. Well, but, I mean, isn't, isn't that considered if you're punching an animal, that's torture, right? Whether it causes serious bodily injury or not. Yeah, it just depends on how the courts look at it. So, and really it's up to the juries. So the judge might say, yeah, but the jury says, no, that doesn't really meet that. So. He, he, died. he died. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't make it, unfortunately. So, um, sad deal, young kid, 21 years old. And so, but taking it serious, make sure that that case was followed because if he's doing this to an animal, what's gonna happen later on down the road? You know, get him in those counseling, because in prison, they can issue those counseling for him and try to help him the best they can. Then Puppy Mills. And here's one case we worked uh, a couple years ago. And this puppy mill here we worked actually turned into not only animal cruelty case, but a human trafficking case. It's a well maintained puppy mill, actually. <laughs> yeah. This was actually a dome structure attached to the garage area. And when you walk in there, it was bad. Uh, there was really no AC or anything. It was hot and muggy, and you can imagine the smells. Yeah, so. Um, but just another one reiterating that link uh, between human violence and animal cruelty. I mean, who, we never would have thought. Do you have a breeding facility like this? No, I mean, as long as you have licenses, you can do it. Um, so they didn't. They didn't have any kind of licenses. Nobody even knew they existed. So. Doesn't it depend on the state? Is it that mm -hmm. starting to outlaw them? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here in Texas, uh, you have to have a license if you have more than 11 breeding females through Texas. So if they had. So here, did you seize all the animals, or did you just tell them go get the license? No, we seized them. Yeah. And so this case, the reason we even found out about this case was it started off as a runaway. All right, how did that happen? So, uh, but yeah, 16-year-old girl runs away. From this home? From this house here. Deputies go back to the property uh, and they contact us and say, hey, there's hundreds of dogs barking. Can y'all help us with that end of it? So sure. So. <coughs> This just kind of shows, depicts the living conditions. Is that at the same no, this is going to be a different one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and so, kind of what what is a pup mill substandard breeder? Uh, so you know, putting profit above the animal's welfare is typically going to be your pup mills. I mean, it's mass breeding. I'm just trying to get these puppies out and save as much money as I can. And so this is kind of what they have estimated here, 4,000 pup meals in the U.S. I, I would bet to say there's more. Um, is, a, is this a breeder that has five females? Do they need a license? Nope. Okay. Yep. And there are good breeders. I mean, we've come across a lot of good breeders here in Texas. Uh, not to say it's bad. Trying to make as as much profit as you can and not putting anything back into your animals is where they get in trouble. And you see the living conditions, things like that. So like a place like Canton, right? And you're like, oh, have you been to Puppy Bill's Animal Alley or whatever? Mm -hmm. I don't want to go near there because I will absolutely <laughs> So, it's a good question. Um, one, it's on private property, and so they're not going to let us go in there, right? Um, two, you know, how illegal is it? I mean, they're just kind of selling animals. I, we can't really go and start a asking for licenses and things of that nature. So, uh, yeah, it's 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 a tough angle to work. Um, 
not to say we don't have anything in plan yet. So we're working with the DA in Van Zandt County to figure out how can we address those issues. So. I know that's a county that has a lot of yeah. illegal activity mm -hmm. with cannabis. Yeah. But the yeah. owner of the camp grounds is the problem. But it's a problem that if they allow it, they can ask to not allow it. Well, yeah, I mean, the profit is so much. I mean, it's a hoarders. I love working hoarding cases. <laughs> love it. <laughs> you know, typically the the stigma was a hoarder was your elderly white female, right? It's not like that anymore. It is changing. And so now we're starting to see that next generation of hoarding come up. And so I'm seeing mom, daughter, and son or kid, small kids living in these conditions growing up this way. Uh, they're getting younger. I'm dealing with hoarders that are in their 40s, 30s. Uh, just dealt with one yesterday, kid that was in his 20s, right? Uh, and so that stigma is changing. It's just. The mental illness is spreading. Yeah, so, you know, hoarding is now considered a mental illness, but right now we just don't know how to treat it. And so that's why if we seize 100 animals from a hoarding case, more than likely they're going to do it again. Uh, and so we're trying to figure out ways to how can we prevent that. And so it's a case by case situation, but that's why we always recommend in these cases, not because we put somebody in jail of our hoarding case, depending on what it is, but they can put those stipulations on their probation that you, she can only be around two animals. Um, you know, start there. We can do inspections on their property for the next two years at any time. And so when we do it through the criminal side, they have to abide by that. So. Can anybody guess how many dogs are in this picture here? This is a 1,100 uh, square foot home. I think it's actually a little bit smaller than that. Uh, this lady was in her 40s with her, she had a 21 year old son. Um, can anybody guess? 50, 100, 150, <laughs> so 123 dogs we pulled out of and one snake. <laughs> so we pull out all these dogs and the son brings out a snake. He's like, don't forget about George. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. uh, but when I looked in here, it was the craziest thing I've seen. So this is the kitchen and you couldn't see a full, I mean, it was just all dogs. And when you try to walk in the house, every nook and cranny had dogs. And so it was a really sad deal. And this is a case that we decided that we weren't going to, the DA's office decided that they weren't going to prosecute this case. Uh, it, she knew she was overhead. She was wanting help. The sheriff's office just didn't know how to work the case. Um, so from last I heard, they're doing really good. I think they've got a few dogs here and there, but it's nothing like this. So. Where do they get the animals from? A lot of them pull them off the streets. And here in the a lot of dumping. Clearly so they can't, I mean, not to say they can't. Yeah, so she had the best intentions in mind, it just got way. It just got way out of hand. And so there's some that, you know. Uh, Yeah, and we call those the rescuers. Uh, and there's several different types of hoarding, but we call those the rescuers. Uh, and then we have some that are just like, no, that animal can only have its life with me because I'm the only one that can care for it. And we deal with those, and those, those ones, they get mean. Whew. They get mean. Rab rabbits. So. And this is the case where it was three generations of hoarding. So, and this was a crazy case because I got called on this, elderly woman dies, son takes his dead mother, puts it in the back of his pickup truck, drives to another county, and then calls 911 and says, hey, my mom died. 
Yeah, right? <laughs> so the sheriff's office shows up and like, what? We need to go back to the house and see what happened if they're investigated, if there's anything. Oh, so, well, he knew the inside the house, the conditions were bad. He didn't want to call 911, they come and see. So he thought, I'm just gonna remove my dead mom, put her in the back of my pickup truck, drive to another county, and then call 911. Awesome. You guys, that don't work. <laughs> okay. Um, and this is another case too, where we got CPS involved. So sheriff's office shows up and they're like, whoa, they call me. Uh, we ended up seizing close to 200 cats. But when I interviewed him, he was in his late 30s. And he actually grew up in this house. So his mom, him. yes, his mom was a hoarder. And he said, well, all the cats actually used to live in the house. I just built these pens out here to help. And he didn't want to let me in the house. And I actually saw sing, uh, swing sets out there. So I was like, okay, some indicators going on. Um, and then he had a little son with him. And so when I walk in the house, his son's in there as well. So um, I ended up calling the sheriff's office and told him, y'all need to get out of here right now. So CPS shows up and he, we ended up charging him for this. Uh, we found multiple dead animals in here. Um, so we filed that case. Uh, I think he ended up being charged with endangerment for a child as well, so. Um, this is kind of a definition of what animal hoarding is, so. What we see without having the ability to properly house or care for them. Um, is it mobile? I mean, was it a city? You can only have so many animals? Like yeah, so I think it varies from city to city. A lot of our hoarding cases are gonna be in the rural areas because there is no ordinances. Uh, or they get caught here in the city and they're like, well, I'll just move out to the country and do it out there. And so uh, that happens a lot too. Not to say we don't get hoarding cases within the city because we do, uh, but typically they're gonna be out in the rural areas. And a lot of times we're not gonna know about it. And a lot of calls with hoarding cases we get are the mailmen, uh, UPS, you know, hey, I went and delivered a package and the smell coming from the house was bad. I could hear lots of dogs barking. Um, so. And some of the indicators. That feces and urine coming from inside the house. Uh, unusual number of animals running around, loose outside or inside. And this thing here, I mean, we see this a lot. And these are just kind of indicators, empty kennels, cages stacked outside the house. I could put money on, I know there's gonna be a lot of animals in that house. And you knock at the door, you hear like a hundred dogs barking. So, uh, but for the most part, we try to help, help them because it is a mental illness. Uh, and that's one thing we got to stay trained upon because all our investigators are certified police officers and we have to go through that training on how to deal with mental illness. Um, and so really speaking with these individuals, how do we talk to them? How can we help them? Um, and there's a few that are just downright mean as hell and you ain't gonna get through them. Uh, but most of them want that help, but they're just scared, they don't trust you, um, you know, and so it's really bridging that gap and trying to help them the best we can. And, you know, a lot of times too, dealing with hoarding cases, us just going in and serving a warrant, taking all their stuff is might not always be the best idea, right? Or the best uh, situation for them uh, because it could turn things to worse. And so how can we slowly work with them depending on how the conditions are, condition of the animals? Is it something we can spay and neuter a few of their animals? I tell you what, can you surrender a couple here? That'll kind of, you know, relieve you. Uh, to help out with your other animals. Um, and we work these hoarding cases every week, every week. And so I, from the 16 years I've been doing this, I think hoarding cases are just spiking. I'm seeing it more and more and more, and I'm seeing that younger generation come up. And so it's sad, but.
Oh yeah. But um, I think the thing that'll stick with me is like, so if somebody gets red flagged and they cannot adopt an animal, what they do is then they send their neighbor, their family member, somebody to go and adopt the animal for them. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, well, how how do you control this if you you know? I mean, I never would have thought of that. So yeah, I mean. Not to say that doesn't happen, because of course it happens, but I will say we do a pretty good job of c catching that at times, because people say certain things, and they'll call me and say, hey, this person here, and they mentioned this, this, and this, and I'm like, okay, let's not move forward yet until we figure out what's going on. That ha that's ha has happened several times here. So like with the SPCA, with the Dallas Animal Shelter, when you're going through the adoption, are they trained to pick up on those things as well? We are, uh, because we red flag, if a name pops up, it big old red thing says, you know, do not adopt, but, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it just, I think, yeah, I mean, if you're trying to get an animal, you can get it anywhere you want. I mean, Craigslist, uh, but if we're seizing animals and they're trying to get their animal back, I mean, we red flag everything. I mean, we do a pretty good job, so. That's it. Questions? Yeah, I just think that generation's coming up, and I think that mental illness is just, I feel like it's an epidemic going through our, our country. Uh, and I just think one of those mental illnesses is hoarding. And it, it, for me, I just, I think my opinion is we just don't know how to treat it. And so it's just gonna spread until we can figure out how to treat it. Mm-hmm, yeah, okay. yes sir. Yeah, so, you know, that's going to be a dispatching system. I always recommend calling 911 or the SPCA of Texas because we work hand in hand with DPD, especially here in the city. Uh, always call 911 or DPD. And if it's something minor, you know, go through your 311. But right now, I know DPD is working on that dispatching system on how they determine which calls come in. Um, you know, is it an ordinance or is it animal cruelty? So. Yeah, we cover four counties. So we got Dallas, Kaufman, Hunt, and Van Zandt County. So what about other like venues? So like yep. who, who covers those? I know the Humane Society North Texas will help out in that area. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think you're talking about maybe the slaughterhouses. Yeah. Yeah, I know they got rid of the slaughterhouses. Yeah. So what was happening when they kind of put that in is they were just dumping them in pastures. So, okay. yeah. And that was a while back? Yeah, that was a while back. Yeah, several years ago. Oh, yeah. You know, these guys aren't coming in and then just being, you know, demonized or left to them. You know, they have a very sensitive place. And they're getting rid of them. 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 And
Yeah, I appreciate it. I oh, appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Well, the good thing is, too, uh, just like Karen said, last year we brought in right around 3,200 animals, and I would say 90% of those animals got great, 96, 96 got great homes. And so, I mean, that's rewarding, right? He's adopted. Yeah. Yeah, he got a great home. Yeah. He ought to see him now. He's all big and goofy and, yeah. Yeah, so it just depends on how we prioritize it. So high, medium, or low. Uh, so how it comes in, we have a list of what we're going to dispatch it out as. So if it comes in at a high, we get out there in 24 hours. So. No, I mean, if you think there's something going on, report it. Uh, we might not open it up as a high if there's not enough evidence there, but you know, a lot of these cases, even like dog fighting, cock fighting cases, I believe there might be cock fighting going on. We still work the case. You know, we get it, we're going to work it. So. Yeah, so if it comes through us, we'll still contact Collin County and say, hey, we got an animal cruelty case, we're going to go ahead and disperse it over to you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's up north as well, even far east, like New York area is really big. Uh, I think it's just culture, generation, and then money. Yeah, so, and then like I said, it's a, you know, animal cruelty is kind of the hub for criminal activity, so it involves everything. So we have, um, I know I worked with the city of Garland on kind of providing them our list, and so they use that as well. Uh, other, you know, we can, but it's if they reach out to us, you know, we'll, we'll try to give them the best we can. But a lot of the cases we have, they're pending. So, you know, we got to kind of give them their due process. And, we yeah. have time for a few more questions. With hoarding, yes. Um, that's a good question. I don't. I don't. Especially cases you file, typically don't see it again. Um, I have seen it, but it's not a lot. Uh, <laughs> you would hope not. Uh, but no, I really don't see it a lot. And if we do, we file it again because once you start getting multiple counts of animal cruelty, it starts enhancing it. And so they have no choice but to put them in jail for a long period of time. So. Yeah, so I think they're trying to work through that, through the legislative, but I couldn't tell you how that's going to work. Uh, I know they are trying to put something together to figure it out. So that might be a year or two down the road. Yeah. <laughs>